Now, there's a little difference on the ending of how great thou art. Watch me. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great. you're here tonight we praise the Lord for your presence it's always good to come together and to worship the Lord amen, amen. to come around his word and spirit and in truth and know the power 
that only the Lord can give. Let's go to God in prayer tonight. We want to remember Francie Griffin in prayer. We want to remember Peggy Justice especially in prayer. We want to pray for the family of Jimmy Dukes. We also want to pray for our nation, our military, our missionaries. And let's pray for the person nearest to you tonight. As we come before God in prayer, as I pray aloud, would you pray silently for that person near you, around you tonight as we pray. Father, how we thank you and glorify your name. Indeed, what a wonderful joy to know that how great is our God. And that we can proclaim from the depths of our heart to God be the glory how great truly you are. And Lord, we just give you praise and honor tonight. We ask that you would be with all of these who are sick and suffering, who are going through various tests and fighting various diseases. We know that you're the Lord over all these things. And God, we know too that you prepared some better place for those who love you. And we pray, God, that you would comfort the hearts of those who are broken as they grieve the loss of loved ones. But they're not really lost if they know Jesus because they'll meet again one day in your glorious and holy presence. And Father, we just thank you for every individual here tonight. If there's someone that needs to make that decision, we know you're waiting for them to come this very night and settle it all in the person of Christ our Savior. Lord, bless us tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. you. may be seated. It is good to see you tonight. If you're visiting, a very special welcome. We encourage you to, to fill out a visitor's card, drop an off and play it a little later in the service, or just uh, hand it to one of us on the way out. It's good to be in the Lord's house. I want to remind you, Tuesday night is outreach night. We encourage you to come and let's go out inviting people to Sunday school and church and praying with one another, having a good time on Tuesday evening. We still pray that you would get prospects in your Sunday school and turn them in so that we might be able to visit them and to go and encourage them to be a part of our services here. I want to remind you too, as we said this morning, we're praying that we'll go ahead and finish off our bus fund and that we'll be able to liquidate that so we can move on with things that are uh, as important or more important as we go forward in the name of the Lord. So keep that in mind. Pray about it. Ask God what he'd have you to do. Be a great blessing in your life. Then remember, circle the date on uh, September the 20th, that Sunday morning. We begin revival. Brother Tim King is going to be preaching. We're going to have folks from his church here singing. Our folks are going to be singing. I hope that they're going to fill every night with songs of joy and praise. We're going to have choir specials and individual specials and all kind of specials. So remember that. But we're going to have some good preaching and we're looking forward to the sharing of the word of God. And we pray that you'll invite folks who need to be saved, who need to be in church. Invite people to come and share in those services together as revival gathers us around the cross. And we share in the joy of what Christ has done for us. And what a blessing to come in his house tonight. I wonder if there are any other announcements we need to make at this time. Brother Ben, the Scott Jesus Children's Choir is going to be singing on the fifth Sunday night scene. So please bring your children to practice at 5 o'clock um, on the Sundays up until that point. Thank you. All right, fifth Sunday night scene coming up. All you singers, get ready. <laughs> and get ready to sing that Sunday night. We're going to have a good time in the fellowship. And all you got to do is just say, Brother John... I'm going to sing that Sunday night, or I'm going to give a testimony that Sunday night, or I'm going to do something that Sunday night. And uh, Wait and let, watch me write it down in this book, okay? <laughs> watch me write it down. Don't just say me and then run off. Watch me. Watch him write it down, and then whisper a prayer, Lord, don't let him lose that book. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Anything else? Well, let's continue as we praise the Lord in song. Richard you mention any prospects, we might consider a few suspects if you've got any. We'll look for them too. Page 15, let's stand and sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing To my heart to sing Thy grace Strings of mercy 
never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. When you go to glory with me, hallelujah, praise. Time out. There's time, time, time out. <clears throat> I was trying to sing the words that, that were up there, but somehow I couldn't make them fit. <laughs> Some of you did a better job than I did. Let's go to the second stanza. Here I raise heaven knees are hither by thy help I'm come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home.
I told Brother John when I got up here, I said, I didn't think you want me to sing no more because you're afraid I'll get better than you. But uh, <clears throat> he... Pre- yeah, he's... <laughs> But uh, he, he asked me to sing. Apparently, y'all been requesting this one again. Um, sang it a couple Sundays ago. I was afraid for a second, Dustin, and got a hold of my phone because I couldn't pull up the playlist. <laughs> <laughs> but but I was able to get it to work. I found out it wasn't Dustin. It was me. <laughs> uh, don't worry, Dustin. Everything is blamed on me, too, so don't worry about it. But uh, <clears throat> I, f- I figured why not. I'll sing this again for y'all. Uh, I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. Maybe. You got it on up there? Yeah, the volume's turned up. One second. (coughs) Might help if you turn the box on.
Amen. No substitute for that old rugged cross and what Christ did for you and me as he died there. Tonight we go back again to John chapter 11. This morning we looked at Jesus being right on time and tonight we're going to look at a passage we've undertitled, Remove the Stone. Remove the Stone. Let's stand out of respect to God's Word. We'll begin reading in verse 28. The Bible said, And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary her sister, secretly saying, The Master is come, and he is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily, and went out, they followed her, saying, She's going unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet and said unto him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again, groaning in himself, comes to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. And Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he's stinking, for he has been dead four days. And Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God. Father, bless your word as we lift it up to you. Thank you for its divine truth in our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you. you may be seated. I know that you can zero in on the passage and the part of the passage that says that if you would see the glory of God, there's something that you must do and something that you must experience in your life. And that something is to remove the stone. Now we saw this morning Martha's encounter with Jesus when he told her and she said, I know, I know. But finally she said, I believe. And when you come to this passage of Scripture, he said, I told you, if you would believe, you would see the glory of God. So to us tonight, God, give us faith enough to believe. Give us strength enough to walk in that belief and to stand for what we truly believe as the children of God. You see, to this passage, it is no different for you tonight than it was for Mary and for Martha. Because first of all, the master is calling for you. He's calling for you to make a decision that you need to make in your heart and in your life tonight. You say, well, I don't hear a voice. You don't have to hear an audible voice. It is the impression and the pull and the power of the Holy Spirit of God in which God calls us. He calls us through his word. He calls us through the impression of the Holy Spirit. He calls us through conviction that we might come to conversion, or he calls us through conviction that we might come to commitment or to consecration under the power of the living God. The master is present. And I want to say to you and to me tonight that he is calling us to a new destiny within our life to serve him and to live for him and to be what we should be in the presence of the living God. You see, in our secular world, man searches to find a cause without any faith. In other words, man said there must be a reason for all this. There must be a reason that caused this to happen. There are psychologists who have spent their entire career analyzing folks who go to church and trying to figure out what it is that makes them go to church. Well, how silly. There are also psychologists who have learned in their studies of all sorts of psychological and clinical psychological uh, episodes that they found out an amazing fact that when people go to church and they pray they feel better they're more stable in their work in the following week and they're able to overcome the stresses of life a whole lot easier when they go to church and when they pray 
But there's also another thing that they've, dis that they've discovered. Clinical psychologists have found out in working with, with uh, medical science that it is an amazing thing that people who are sick and know that somebody is praying for them, their healing time is less, and they're strengthened in their fight against diseases, and they say this is some unknown phenomena and we don't understand it. Well, I understand it. It is the spirit and the power of God at work in people's lives to heal and to make them well. Amen. It is the spirit and the power of God and the presence of God who is right there with them in the greatest need of their life. So we don't have to look for a cause for everything. We can simply settle our case in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he is with us wherever we go, that there are blessings he has in store for us, there are things that God wants to do in our life and in our heart if we will just open ourselves and surrender to the authority of that cross that he exercised when he obeyed the Father to the nth degree and was nailed there that you and I may be saved from our sin and we may live a life that is abundant in him in the power of the presence of the Holy Spirit. But in order to do that, we must clear the way for God to do his work. We must clear the way for God to do his work. You see, tonight there are people who say, you can say, would you like to be blessed to God? Amen, amen, amen. Would you like to know the power and the precious promises of God? Amen, amen, amen. And then they say, well, I don't know why that doesn't happen in my life. I don't know why I don't experience that joy or I don't experience that freedom or I don't experience that wonderful glow of salvation. Well, I can tell you why. Because there is something that is blocking what God wants to do in your life and something that is standing in the way like a gigantic shield to keep you from fully knowing the power of the glory of God. Amen. I have a friend of mine who I'm always battering. Several years ago, he went down to Mexico with us and, and he was at a point where they closed the borders to be able to get over. There was so much trouble with the cartel and this sort of thing. And so I, I said to him, I said, Jim, I'm going, I'm going to ride down about 20 miles down here and see if that part of the border's open and, <laughs> and we'll cross over there. He said, oh, now wait a minute. I said, I know what you're going to try to do. You're going to try to find some back road into there. I said, man, ain't no back road into the border. <laughs> What's the matter with you? I said, you got to cross at an international crossing. But anyway, when we got to the place to cross the border, he jumped out of the van and ran over to the parking lot. So we pulled over in the parking lot, stopped, parked the car, and walked across the border to where we were going. My point being this is since that time, he's never been back with us. I don't know how scared he got. But I'm saying this, that I can call him and talk to him, or he'll call me, and I'll say, now, we're going to go November the 9th. I'd like for you to go with us. You know what he says? He said, there's static on this line. This phone's breaking up. I can't hear it. I, I can't hear it. So I saw him yesterday at that wedding I performed. I said, hey, guess what? We're not on a cell phone. You can hear everything I'm saying. Amen. But you see, the reason that sometimes we don't hear God and the reason sometimes we don't see God work in our life is because we got so much static going on and we got so many things that do not clear the way for the power and the purpose of God to occur within our life. There may be so many things of earth call upon us, so many present duties or family obligations or whatever. You just fill in the blank. But it keeps us from hearing the voice of God. And those obstacles keep us away from the church. They keep us away from prayer. They keep us away from the Bible. They keep us away from service. They keep us away from all sorts of things where God could clearly show us his glory. But my friends, I'm telling you tonight, we must clear the way. How on the earth does that happen? And what do we do? You see, the world finds a cause to try to work without faith. You see, what they try to do is they say, well, you know, I had a good doctor. That, that's what happened. I, I got a good deal on this thing. That's what happened. I had a added some good advice. Listen, the Bible said the steps of a godly man are ordered by the Lord. And if you don't believe that, you're in trouble already tonight. But if you believe that God orders the steps of a godly man, then whatever you do and whatever's accomplished in your life, 
Oh, yes, he might have been a good doctor. Yes, that might have been a good business deal. Yes, that might have been good advice. But ultimately, it is the power of the person of God that makes the difference in our lives. Amen. Amen. And we can rejoice in what the Lord does. So we must clear the way that we see the glory of God. How is that going to happen? Well, I suggest to you three things out of this passage of Scripture. Let's go to the Word very quickly. Number one, it takes responding quickly to the Word of God. Now notice very carefully as you look down there, verse 28, and when she had so said, talking about Martha, she went her way and she called Mary and said, The Master has come and called it for you. In verse 29, as soon as she heard that, she arose and just sort of drug herself around and said, well, I'll get over there to see him eventually. No. You ought to underline that word quickly right there in that verse. She did not delay. She did not tarry. She had to get to where Jesus was. We're all made aware of the call of God upon our life. I say it again. Every one of us in this room really deep down inside know what God wants us to do. We really do. Now, I can understand sometimes people may be searching in a certain area for a particular way of the will of God, but all of us know. And if we're going to walk in that will, then we must respond quickly because we're made aware of his call upon our life. Those who are not saved know they need to be saved. Those who are not a member of God's family, they know they need to be. Those who aren't baptized know they need to be. Those who are not serving know they need to be. We're made aware of all that, but we must not delay in our response to him. She came quickly to where it was. You see, when the invitation is given tonight, we need to get down here to this altar and cry out unto God and say, Lord, I'm yours. Whatever you want, whatever you desire, whatever you want, I don't care what it is. Whatever you want me to do, that's exactly what I'll do. And that's exactly how I live in your presence day by day. And my friends, when you do that, you're beginning to clear the way for the glory of God to shine in your life. Amen. But when you sit in church and you walk out and say, well, I should have I done something tonight. Or you sit there and you say, well, maybe not tonight, maybe later. Or you sit there and you think, well, I got too much going on and there, there's too many things I want to do and, well, you know what? You'll never see the glory of God because you've got too many blockages in the way. It takes responding quickly to the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. But let's look at the second thing. It takes meeting Jesus while he is present. Look at verses 30 through 37. The Bible said, Now Jesus was not yet coming to the town. Remember this morning we saw that he was two miles from Jerusalem to Bethany. And in that two miles, he had already had an encounter with Martha, and now Mary comes to meet him. And the Word of God says, Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Martha met him, and the Jews which were with her in the house that comforted her when they saw her jump up and run out, they said, Oh, she's going to the tomb to weep again and to cry again. You see, a lot of people think you're seeking a lot of things instead of seeking Jesus. Amen. But the truth is that when you follow the leadership of the Lord, you're seeking the Lord. It doesn't matter what people say. It doesn't matter what people think. People's opinions matter very little when it comes to our relationship to Jesus Christ. So if you're afraid of what people will think, then you've got another thought coming. There are a lot of people who sit in misery and never see the glory of God because they will not let go and let God have his way. People's opinion really don't matter when it comes something between you and Jesus. We're more worried about what people think than we are about what God thinks. We're more worried about what our friends are going to say than what Jesus has already said for us to do. Listen, take the high road. Put your hand in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ and trust him more in what he has said than what people think by their word and just trust God and know the glory of God and the joy of God and the peace of God that passes all understanding. Once you come to him, look at verse 32. Once you come to him, fall at his feet. Humble yourself on the mighty hand of God that God can raise you up. Listen, to take that time to humble yourself before God. You know what? It's gotten passe. It's gotten out of vogue. It's gotten out of style for people to get on their knees and cry out and 
call unto God. I can remember even as a little boy, I was amazed in that old church that had a wooden rail all the way around and, and the floors were wooden. And I was amazed when they'd give an altar call and people would get up from that altar and go back to their seats and I'd look down there on that floor and it would be wet with the tears of people who were down there weeping before Almighty God. I ask you tonight, how long has it been since you've been broken before God? That you wept in His presence and you cried out unto Him. Why is that necessary to fall at His feet? Because number one, look at verse 33, He has moved with compassion for you. And when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, Jesus knows. He understands what's breaking your heart. He knows what's going on in your life. And my friends, the Bible says he's moved with compassion toward you. And when you fall at his feet, he inquires into your need. Look at verse 34. And he said, where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Now the amazing thing is that the Bible says that Jesus is touched by our infirmities. Amen. He's touched with our heartaches. He knows the things that we're concerned about. It doesn't matter if you're a teenager. It doesn't matter if you're a boy or girl, mom or dad, parent or grandparent. He knows the things that breaks your heart, and he knows the things that trouble your soul. And the Bible says in verse 35 that he weeps with us when we weep. He knows all about, the old song said, he knows all about our troubles. He knows all about our cares. It is he who lifts us up from the valley of despair. He knows. Now the word of God says very plain, the shortest verse in the Bible, verse 35, Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Now why did Jesus weep? You find very little emotion in the heart and the and the passion of the Lord Jesus at all times. But the Bible says Jesus wept. The Holy Spirit put that there. I think that there are two or three reasons I suggest to you why Jesus wept. Jesus did not weep because Lazarus had died. Jesus did not weep because his friend had died. Why? Because he knew he had power to raise him up. Amen. That was no problem with him. Death is not a problem with God. It's a problem to us. But Jesus could say in John 14, as we'll read later on in this book, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. So it's not a problem to him. Sickness is not a problem. It's a problem to us. But he's moved with compassion. And the Bible said Jesus wept. Let me suggest two or three things. Number one, I think Jesus wept because people failed to understand what Jesus was all about. They fail to understand that he is the way, the true, and the life. Have you ever been so misunderstood that it broke your heart? Ever been so misunderstood that, that people thought you were trying to say one thing and actually that's not what you were saying at all? You were trying to do something for their own good and their own blessing and it just broke your heart because they would not understand what you were trying to say to them. And the amazing thing is that the power and the purpose and the promise of God and that reality is I believe Jesus wept because people fail to understand what was going on. I think Jesus secondly wept because he knew that Lazarus would have to die again. He knew that he would raise him up from the dead, but he knew that he would have to face the sting of death again. And yet though the sting of death offers no power against the child of God, he knew that he'd have to go through whatever it was to take him out. Remember we said the other day there are four reasons why we get sick and suffer. And one of those reasons was that it is to take us home to be with the Lord. And he knew that that was going to have to happen again in Lazarus's life. And he knew that it was going to have to happen again in the depth of his soul. But then I think he wept because men had missed the truth of the power of the Savior. The Bible says on one occasion that Jesus looked out upon the, the great city of Jerusalem and Jesus stood there and was moved with compassion and he said, how many times would I have gathered you to myself as a hen would gather her biddies? How many times would I have done that? And you would not. I tried everything. I gave you every opportunity. I gave you every occasion for the glory of God. But there came a day when I had showed you all these things. 
and I had to write Ichabod over the door, which means the glory has departed because you refused to follow me and listen to the power of God. Folks, let me tell you something. That is no myth. That is no ancient saying. It happens today in the day and age in which you and I live. When people refuse the glory of God and the presence of God and the power of God, when they refuse the peace of God, there comes a day when God writes Ichabod over the door and the glory departs and it'll never be the same again and it will never happen anymore. I'm sad to say to you that up and down this land where I've been, I've seen churches that that has happened to I've seen churches that were overwhelmingly full and the Lord was blessing and they turned against the glory of God for the passion and the praise of man. And you know what happened? I can ride by one of those churches now. I could take you to it tonight. And you know what that church is? It's a hay barn where they use it now to store hay because the church has been closed up for several years and it's dried up and died. Boy, that's a sad... Every time I pass that place, I say, oh God, don't let me ever be in a place where the glory has departed, but you be real and certain and you know that we want to clear the way, Lord, for you to do what you want to do. I believe Jesus wept for more reasons than just the fact that Lazarus had died. And the Word of God tells us that he weeped for you. People's ideas of God's remedies are faulty. Look at verses 36 and 7. Then said the Jews, behold how he loved him. His love for him had nothing to do with what was going on at that moment. But boy, they had their own interpretation. Then some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind, couldn't he have made this man well so that he would not have died? Might have been. Could be. If only. Those are negative things. Hey, if you live in the past of what could have been or might be, you're going to be a disappointed, miserable individual. Jesus had the power to do anything Jesus wants to do, and he still does today. And he has that power in your heart and in your life. People's ideas of God's remedies are faulty. A lot of times people think, well, God won't say this or God. You know, I'm always amazed when I hear these people stand up and they say, well, God told me this, or God told me that, or God told me the other. I must be the most carnal individual in the world because God don't speak to me that way. Let me tell you how God speaks to me. The same way that I believe God speaks to all of you, God speaks, number one, through his word. His word, which is designed by the power of the Holy Spirit, God speaks through his word. Secondly, God speaks to, through spiritual individuals who have the wisdom of his word and who have walked with God. And what they say, I know I can depend upon because there are people who walk with God. Third, God speaks. God speaks through the very presence of the Holy Spirit impressing upon our lives what he wants us to do. Now, let me tell you, a lot of people talk like every morning they get up and God's written a note and pinned it to the foot of their bed. I want to tell you, God don't do that, amen? It'd be like that old, old story of the man who had preached all those years and he came back and he said, well, I've made a great mistake. He said, I was out there in the, in the field and he said a big old plane come over and, and just began to write up in the sky and it wrote GP and I thought that meant go preach. He said what it really meant was go plow. He said I messed up. Well, I'll tell you what, when you look at the things of the world, they will mess you up. But when you look at the things of God, you can trust with certainty in what God wants you to do. Through prayer, he will impress you. Through his word, he will teach you. Through godly people, he will lead you by the power and the presence of his truth. Let me tell you something. And this is one of the most amazing phenomenons to me that I've ever experienced in my life. When I was a young preacher starting out, and, and, I, and I talked with a lot of preachers, and I said, you know, what do you read and what are you studying? A lot of them said, oh, well, I just studied the Bible, and they wouldn't tell me anything. There was uh, one preacher who told me in a nearby church from here, he said, look here. He said, I got a filing cabinet full of sermons down there. He said, come and get you a handful of them and you can preach them. Well, I knew I couldn't preach his sermons because that wasn't what God called me to do. You see, it's all the same light on the other side of that window. 
But when the sun shines through, it's colored by the frames of those prisms of different color. And that's the way it is with you. It's all the same light of the glory of God. But when God shines through you, it has a different hue and a different tone and a different way and a different method. That's why God created us all different that we might glorify His holy and precious name. Amen. And so you know what I'd do? I'd go in a bookstore. I'd look at a book, Christian bookstore, and, and I, I would pray, God, just show me, what I, show me what I should get so that I can learn and study. And I'd put my hand on a book, and I'd tell you the truth. When I'd pick up that book, I'd know there was just something, and it, that something was the Holy Spirit of God that says, put that back. You don't need that. He didn't say that in an audible voice. He didn't say that where it was announced over the loudspeaker. It was just impressed in my heart, and I'd put it back. Or I'd pick up another book, and yeah, I would just feel the warmth and the blessing of God. And I'm not telling you to go by feelings. I'm just telling you to go by faith. I'm just telling you something that happened to me. And you know what? Years later, when I began to look at my library of hundreds and hundreds of books, did you know I found out in that library there was not one single book that I'd ever chosen before I'd studied anything that was the wrong book to have. Why? Because the Holy Spirit of God led. Not me, but the Spirit of the living God. You see, God's things, as he said, his ways are different than our ways, and he has remedies that man mistake. But it is the power and the purpose and the promise of God if we will lay hold upon him. My friends, We've got to remove and clear the way so that the glory of God can be seen. Now let's come in here real quick. <clears throat> it takes obedience to what he says. Look down at verses 38 through 40. This is the synopsis. This is the close of the whole thing. Number one in verse 38, he will meet you at your point of need. Jesus, therefore, again groaning in himself. Second time that phrase is used. It's not because he's in sorrow. It's because of the agony of misunderstanding of those around him. Groaning within himself, he comes to the grave. It was a cave, and there was a stone that lay upon it. There it is. Here's the miracle-working God who can heal the sick and cause the blind to see and the deaf to hear. Inside that cave is a man who has been dead for four days. And there's a big stone between the miracle-working Jesus and the dead man. What's the first thing that Jesus said? Now, I want all y'all to get out here and light a candle and let's sing Kumbaya. No. He didn't say, well, I think we ought to form us a committee here and decide how we're going to handle this thing. No, he didn't do that. He didn't say, well, let's all get together and kind of check and see where we are with everything and we need to get an exploratory committee to really see how we're going to handle this situation. No, he didn't do that. You know what he said? Look carefully. Mark it in your Bible, verse 39. Jesus said one thing. <clears throat> Take away the stone. Take away the stone. Now watch this very carefully because the Word of God says, as Jesus said, take away the stone. Mary, the, the sister of him that was dead, said, Lord, he's been dead three, uh, four days and he's stinking because of the malefaction of the body. Now watch verse 40. And Jesus said, not I unto you that if you would believe. There it is. If you would believe. Not just know. Because all of you know. But now it's time to put your entire weight upon what you know and who you know, he said, and if you would believe, you would see the glory of God. Amen. We used to sing the song. We don't sing it anymore. You musicians need to crank it up again. Only believe, only believe, all things are possible, only believe. You remember singing that? Jesus said, now here's the one thing you got to do. Now watch it carefully. You got to get rid of the stone. You got to move the stone. You're going to see the glory of God. Now come in here real quick. You see, here's a miracle working Jesus. Here's a man that's dead. The only thing separating them is a stone. Let me tell you something about you and me tonight. 
in our lives, there's some dead spots. Here's a miracle working Jesus who's here in Hoboken Baptist Church tonight and the Lord is present in this place because he said he'd be present in this place. And he said, now, you want to see the glory of God? You want to see the blessing of God? Then the only thing that's holding you from seeing the glory and the blessing of God is those stones that you've got stacked up one on top of another between you and the miracle-working Jesus who is able to bring life out of death, hope out of despair, help out of sorrow, to bring victory in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Move the stone. You see, number one, he said, move the stone without accepting. Yeah, but you just don't know. I'm telling you what, the way that person hurt me back over yonder. Well, let me tell you what, that's a stone. Hello? Well, I'll tell you one thing. I just won't ever speak to her anymore. That's a stone. Well, I won't tell you this happened. And you know, there's something I've found about a lot of churches, and it's true right here in this church as well, that when people start talking about something that happened, you to think it happened this morning. It might have happened 20 years ago. But the way people talk about it, it just happened this morning. No! That's a stone that's standing in the way of us seeing the glory of God, how we need to get rid of those stones and come to the altar of God so that he can touch the deadness of our soul and the deadness of our life and the dead spots of our church and cause us to live with a vibrant power of the Holy Son of God. Amen. Amen. Move the stone without exception. If you've got an exception, you're never going to see the glory of God. Well, I know the Lord wants me to do that, but you just don't know how I was hurt. Hey, you better get rid of the stone. Yeah, but I want to tell you what that happened to me 10 years ago. No, you better get rid of the stone. Yeah, but I, I'm telling you, I know, I know, but there come those old goats and they're butting again, amen? Jesus said, get rid of the stone without exception, then get rid of the stone without excuses. Oh boy, we can conjure up excuses, amen? Remember that old song of the Kingsman, excuses, excuses, you hear them every day. Excuses, that's the reason. From church, you stay away. I like that part where it says, and the poor kid, they all of them had to stay home and wipe the poor kid's nose. Amen? When I saw that preacher, he must be the most stuck-up man. He didn't even shake my hand. Excuses. You see, excuses become stones that block the power of God, that release the glory of God. Jesus said, look, if you will just believe. Now, what did that have to do with it? He said, I want you to roll the stone away. But then he turns around to Martha, and the word is clear. He said, did not I say to you, if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? You know what keeps us from moving the stones? Belief. We just don't believe it'll happen. We don't believe we can handle it. We don't believe that we can forgive it. We don't believe that we can whatever. I'm telling you this morning, I'm telling you this night. I'm telling you this week. I'm telling you every day. Get rid of the stone that you will see the glory of God because he will willingly. You see, God's not trying to keep anything from you. God said he wants to bless you. I'm coming that you might have life. Remember back over in John chapter 10 when we passed by there and we stopped? He said, I'm coming that you might have life and you might have it more what? Abundantly. I want you to see my glory. I want you to see my power. I want you to walk in joy. I want you to walk in the filled work of the Holy Spirit. I want you to be happy in the Lord. But it's never going to happen unless you believe him enough to roll the stone away. The Savior's waiting. He's got all the glory that you and I could ever imagine. We couldn't even conceive of all the glory that is God's. But my friend, I want to tell you, nothing will happen until we roll the stone away. Do you want to see the glory of God right now? You want to see the glory of God in your life this very minute? 
then roll the stones away that are hindering you. There may be somebody you need to go to and embrace them and say, you know, I apologize. Forgive me. You say, well, I ain't done nothing wrong. That's a stone. Just go ahead and say, hey, let's clear the road. Let's see the glory of God in this place. Maybe tonight. There's something from years ago that you've never let go. You better, you better move the stone out of the way so that you might see the glory of God in this place. Let go. Let God have his way this very minute. Amen. Lord, I pray in this time as we prepare to sing this hymn of invitation.